Hello and welcome back, everybody. You were expecting us to be talking about the Disney board, but we're going to hold off just a little bit on that one. Mike will be joining us tomorrow, probably, to cover the Disney board and all of the craziness that is happening with the attempted takeover, or not takeover, but attempted uh, takeover of a seat by Nelson Peltz and the uh, Tryon Group trying to get Disney back into the right order. Or if you're on the side of uh, Robert Iger and all of his initiatives, perhaps you think that is a negative. Whatever the case may be, today we're going to be looking at something a little bit different, which is the Hogwarts Legacy game, which according to my insiders, have uh, they have said that this is the barometer by which Warner Brothers Discovery will be determining the future of the Harry Potter series. Joining us today is Stephen. He is uh, coming to us to talk all things video games. I consider consider him a video game expert. And yes, he does actually work in the industry even. I don't know if we're allowed to talk much about that, Stephen. How are you today? Uh, I'm doing all right. Is my avatar showing up or do I got to go like full screen and just do this? Oh, there you go. I like it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> go full yeah, screen. You're good. Oh, now okay. everybody can see exactly what you look like. That is the actual representation of Steven. I think yes. that was taken, uh, that, that's, a, that's a photo, I believe, actually. That's not even a drawing. It's actually so, AI uh, art. Oh, there you go. All right, yeah. so uh, Steven, we are talking today about Hogwarts Legacy and how that game is uh, on its way to being one of the biggest games of 2023, perhaps the biggest. It's certainly the most highly anticipated at this time, and that's not making everybody happy, but we're going to avoid some of the uh, social drama surrounding this game, and we're going to talk about the business aspects of it. So if you're here to, uh, to to wade into massive controversy, I don't know that we can help you out with that. We're really going to be talking about the economics behind this game and the path forward for Warner Brothers Discovery. Yeah. All right, let's jump right into it. Go ahead. Oh, that's right. Sorry, I had one thing to add to this, because the last time I've seen a game this big with this much type of, like, um, what you call, I would just call it a hot plate of everything, it was Last of Us 2 and that release and how everything was going with that. So this is pretty much up on that tier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is uh, this is a big game with lots of things to do inside of it, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we've uh, quite scratched the surface of what all people will be able to enjoy, especially if there's a lot of DLC coming out in the future. Yeah, but the, uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, but also depending on the edition you are you are getting, uh, some of them have, I believe, locked in exclusive content depending on what edition you pre-order. But that that's just video game news. I'm nerding out a bit. Oh, you're you good. We'll take we'll take all of the uh, the expert analysis we can get and the information you have. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, Paul Tassi is the author of this article from Forbes. Hogwarts Legacy is already the number one selling game on Steam and PS5, number two on Xbox. So let's dive right in. Paul says, we are just under four weeks away from the release of Hogwarts Legacy on February 10th, but it's already shaping up to be one of the best selling games of the year. Pre-sales for Hogwarts Legacy have been absolutely unbelievable, and it shows no sign of slowing down as we get closer to launch. Um, now... Stephen, can you walk us through in the most germane way, so avoiding as much as we can all of the muck that surrounds this, can you walk us through why there is a, I don't know what size contingency of, uh, of consumers this might be, but there's some group of people out there that they don't want this game to succeed. Can you walk us through some of the reasons? Well, uh, well, if we're gonna label, let's go through baby steps. We can pretty much label it off like this: we're dealing with personal bias, a vocal um, minority of that vocal bias, and then a condescending attitude towards people who are opposite of that personal bias. And that is what's happening. And that happens with anything that goes against uh, people, I guess, who are suffering from an irrelevancy complex. But <laughs> I'm not, that's, what's, <laughs> that's one way to put it, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's just it. You either you're either irrelevant, you're popular or you're jumping on a bandwagon or trend that is popular, and then you try to choose a side. And it still comes down to sides, but I'm not gonna get into the muck like you said. The problem is if you take the muck away, this is still a big property when you look at the Universal Parks or you look at Harry Potter as a generalization, whether it be the books, whether it be the films, because people like either or, or like one or the other, depending on how large of a fan and how passionate they are. Mary Mayhem, for instance, I believe loves the books more, a lot more than the uh, films, but you have that huge fan base, and because it's such a huge fan base, of course, someone's going to go after it with their own opposite. Point. Absolutely. Yeah. And essentially, too, what this comes down to is that there are people who are unhappy yeah. because the original author of the Harry Potter franchise has certain sociocultural slash political slash ideological positions and how she views the world. 
Mm -hmm. and they view those opinions as hurtful, harmful, etc. We're not going to get into who's Full right, more. who's wrong, or any of that. We're not even going to touch it. No. Um, but we do need to acknowledge it so that we can understand the economics behind this. Because mm -hmm. the big thing here, and I know that there are, oh my gosh, there are so many more subscribers than just two weeks ago when I first launched the channel. But two weeks ago, the opening day uh, salvo of five different YouTube videos I put out there, right. one of them was about the Harry Potter reboot. Mm -hmm. And that's a real thing. And it's, it's something that we have been hearing about from back channels, from sources uh, that Warner Brothers Discovery wants to do. They want to get something out there that returns back to young Harry Potter. Because if you don't have a young Harry Potter, then you can't sell young Harry merchandise, really, because you don't have new content. And the issue there is that what Warner Brothers Discovery is looking at is that everything Fantastic Beasts, all of this auxiliary stuff to Harry Potter, it just doesn't, it's not connecting with the fans. The, the brand loyalty isn't there in the same level. But everything that's related to Hogwarts, related to uh, young Harry Potter, all the original characters, the books, etc., people love it. Mm -hmm. Even the people who don't like the original author, J.K. Rowling, they still love those original stories. And so Warner Brothers needs to get back to it. Now, mm -hmm. this is sort of the barometer that they're using. This game, they're trying to judge, like, can we go back to that stuff or... You know, is the demographic that's angry about this franchise, is it big enough that it's too problematic to go back right now? And so far, it looks like that, no, that this property, although there will be a backlash, this property is huge and it makes a lot of money and businesses like money. Let me read this, uh, this next paragraph from Paul real quick. Just He's going to talk about, from his opinion, uh, what the situation is. He says, as ever, I will mention that this is all happening in the wake of an extremely heated culture war in which a line in the sand has been drawn by many online who claim that purchasing Hogwarts legacy puts money in J.K. Rowling's pocket, who has repeatedly espoused. And I'm not going to say that next part because to say it would be to take a position. And we're not going to take any position at all, not because we want to avoid position, but simply because we want to keep our scope narrowed solely on the economics. Uh, question. Conversely, conversely, go ahead. Oh, the question that I have is, is it okay if I am in a sitting position while we do this content? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, you know, right, as, long as, as long as you're doing, uh, oh, I need to remember all, all the yoga positions I could tell you to do no, right now. But no, no, I, we'll no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make anyone watching this video visualize me in any yoga position. You want and he's back. pulled seven muscles, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Conversely, there are spite buyers who claim the controversy will only help the game sell more copies. Well, I don't think that's happening, speaking to Paul. What's clear is that Hogwarts Legacy is going to be a huge seller no matter what controversies may be attached to it. And really, that is the bottom line, is that we are seeing this game uh, build more and more enthusiasm, momentum, etc. Stephen, why is that? What is it about this game that is driving people back to the Harry Potter franchise after anything other than the theme parks really has not gained the kind of traction that we saw for so long when the, the franchise was rolling with the original novels and the original movies. What is it about the game that's bringing people back? Uh, well, I believe it's the fact that you get to be yourself, um, your own wizard within an open world RPG. So if it's claiming to be an open world RPG, not only is it going to have the ability to customize your spells and your character and your home base and everything else, you're going to freely explore the world of Harry Potter like you usually don't get through a movie or you make with the imagination of your books. This is going to grab people and let them experience what they've always wanted to be like just by how they uh, take the Harry Potter test. Are you a wizard? What's your specter of Patronus and all that stuff? This is opening their imaginations to a world that they might not even be able to afford going to say to a universal park. This is their universal park. Oh, that's a, that is a fantastic up. point. If, if yeah. anybody pulls anything from this video today, if there's anything you take away, Stephen just nailed it. I could not say that any better at all. This See, is the opportunity for people to go do what other people have been doing at the parks, but for geographic reasons or for financial reasons, if you can't go to the, uh, the various Harry Potter lands across the world, this is, this is at least as good, and it, it's probably better in terms of role-playing that, that, that world and that, uh, uh, that identity that people built up as they role-played through reading the books and imagining themselves in this world. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's take a look down here. Uh, this is coming. I apologize. I skipped over the byline here. This is Hogwarts Legacy Leak Reveals Game Link. This is from Game Rant, and it's by Parth Bagaria. Uh, and we say we see here, a new leak for Hogwarts Legacy reveals the total playtime fans can expect from the main story and its side content. One of the biggest games of 2023. Let's skip through all the rest because we want to get right to what it is. And uh, no spoilers, ladies and gentlemen. As reported by Video Games Chronicle, a new leak reveals that the main story of Hogwarts Legacy will take around 35 hours to finish with 70 hours needed for 100% completion. Now, that to me sounds like a significant game. That's not Skyrim level, but that's not bad. Steven, is that what you were expecting out of this game? Is that that mm -hmm. match up with expectations? No, my uh, no, not at all, but that is quite big. But that's going to be great for completionists. For me, it's not really the length of the game. It's how much enjoyment I can go get through a sitting. Because for myself, I do stream. You know this. I do a lot of games. If the game entices me, like let's look at Hogwarts, and it, I lose, let's say, four hours in a stream or playing offline, and it feels like an hour, then that game's accomplished a lot more than how long it is. It also depends how much a casual player is going to play, a dedicated player is going to play, or an addicted player is going to play. You're going to look at those aspects and how much energy you're going to want to put through this, how much you're going to want to like space it out to enjoy it all, or you're just going to burn through it. So I think 70 hours is is great. There might, There's openings for DLC in more areas in the future, and I haven't really dug in to see whether or not they're going to have any like a new game plus or a way to like branch off and restart a new character and go down a different path. So if you're going to do repetitive, repetitive characters, do you get different ways of storyline each time you play it through. Sure, replayability would be a big thing yeah. if that's if that's part of it. Now, have you looked into the monetization of this game at all? Do you are you aware of how no. this is working? The, the, the only monetization I've looked into is everyone saying they're going to buy this, and that's usually just on Twitter. <laughs> well, that's, um, a, that's a great monetization plan for all you video yeah. game companies out there. Okay, if you're with Blizzard right now and you're listening to uh, how to how to make this happen, you want people to buy your game up front. Uh, there's a lot of live action stuff that's uh, being driven by these other companies. I use Blizzard as sort of the uh, the punching bag here, but there are a lot of big companies out there that are releasing live action games, or not live action. They're releasing. Uh, <laughs> what's my word there, Stephen? Help me out. I'm stumbling. Um, something with better monetization live models. Live, oh, service. live service. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, so they're the releasing virus. live service games, and then they le they release them with no price tag up front. Then they, they uh, crowd them with all kinds of cosmetics and things that are unnecessary. And people just get inundated then with it becoming more and more like, you know, log into eBay and see how much you got to spend today to get uh, oh. some new little visual widget. Why so, is Overwatch flashing through my head right now? Oh, my gosh. And, you know, they're, they're, it's everybody chasing Fortnite. That's what's going on. Everybody's yeah, trying to chase Fortnite, but they can't do it as well for whatever reason. Or at least they mm -hmm. don't want to. All right, but Hogwarts Legacy not looking like that. All right, no. so let's uh, let's dive in now to get the uh, the counter argument on this. This is from uh, them dot us, and uh, this one is Heartstopper Star Sebastian Croft apologizes for involvement in Hogwarts Legacy by Abby Montiel. All right, we'll we'll cover this briefly. Okay. Uh, it says, Heartstopper star Sebastian Croft, who plays Ben in the LGBTQ plus teen Netflix series, addressed some backlash over his role in the upcoming Harry Potter video game Hogwarts Legacy. On January 11th, the game's official account announced that the 21-year-old actor voices the game's playable character. And this article goes on to basically say that the individual playing this, uh, you know, playing a character, playing the voice behind a character, uh, is apologizing to the world for having committed the sin of being a part of this franchise. So, Stephen, this, I think, is where some of the most difficulty lies for Warner Brothers Discovery going forward with the franchise is because we're already seeing with, with Hogwarts Legacy, people will flock back. They will buy this. They will buy mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of Harry Potter merchandise. They will go to new Harry Potter movies. They will watch the shows. But on the talent side of things, there is intense pressure for cast, for actors, for all sorts of people involved in, in Hollywood and, and behind the, the cameras, in front of the cameras, to not participate in anything related with J.K. Rowling. So, in your opinion, how big of a deal is that? But the way this sounds is, excuse my wording, is asinine because in a way it's showing inclusivity and respect by hiring this person to do the voice acting. So how are you shaming someone who contributed to a project that's already under scrutiny who probably is a fan 
it's like we're, we're forgetting the whole point of a lot of these people who want to do these projects or be hired for these projects are fans or they love the properties. Cavill is a prime example. If we look at Cavill and his history, whether it be The Witcher, the, the, the Warhammer stuff we're hearing about, or even Superman. The, 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 if you're getting a fan in there that wants to be a part of something, you shouldn't be shaming them. You should be looking at how well they want to deliver an honest, true character or whatever they're doing for it from their heart. And we're all they're all blowing this over. They're all blowing this over. They're taking the humanity out of the people just because of a bias. And no, no offense to business, I don't think business actually is going to look at that when their main goal is to make money. And right now, what this is doing, this is sensational news. If, if we look at it with, with an outside source, this looks like a sensational news. What is the 90s theme? This sells, this sells, and this sells. And it's falling under one of those categories. Bad press is still good press because everyone's still looking at your stuff. No one's oh, talking. About I had not else. thought of that. You're right. So the the controversy surrounding this, where you've got different people yeah. protesting and and claiming that it's uh, bigotry to even purchase the the game, um, that may be driving even more press and driving even more people to purchase the game. Yeah. Because you have to wonder how many people would agree with that, but how many people would then, because of all of that uh, kerfuffle, they would come across articles. And then that, that person may say, well, I, I don't really believe any of that. Or, you know, maybe I believe 90% of it. Or maybe I, I suppose that I believe it, but I also really like Harry Potter. So I'm going to buy the game anyway. So you got to think that bad press thing. Yeah, you're right. I think that's, uh, that's having an impact on this game's anticipation. I think there's more people out there that have done an online Harry Potter test than tried to change the tags of a video game on Steam. <laughs> that's a great point. Now, Stephen, you did a video recently. And uh, you were talking about some drama... Uh, surrounding the game that can you can you bring us in in a way that is uh, is safe for this type of a channel and for the kind of content we produce but can you explain so we understand sort of even commentating and even uh, maybe in the future reviewing this game is going to be problematic because there are people who really don't want that to happen so what was your experience well, to me, um, what, uh, you know Lorena Creole. I work with her at the lunch table and all of that and stuff. she's a source of total positivity. I mean, she oh, is oh, just yes. positivity uh, uh, embodied. With the right to carry. Yes, very positive. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but she, she quote tweeted someone, and I couldn't see the tweet, and I had to do digging on an alt account to see who it was. And as soon as I saw the name, everything I remember of this name came flashing back. And this was related to something that happened two years ago with another, uh, I'm going to call it a campaign to so kind of ruin a certain individual's career. I'm not going to give names. You can do your own research or check out the video later. And then I started seeing the tweet, and I'm like, just because I'm part of a choir, I can also not buy this. And that's, that's like a really lame scapegoat to say, well, I can do this. You should do it too. You well, worked it was, To explain that, to explain that, what that Supposedly, means. There was, there was an individual, yeah. right? There was yes. an individual who had worked within the property, within the franchise in the past mm -hmm. and was using that, having worked on As validation. This, uh, this content, right? as a way to say, if I can work on this in the past and love my experience with it in the past, and yet still boycott it, not buy it, et cetera, then so can you, you super yeah. fans, you casual fans, et cetera, because you haven't worked on it. Uh, that's, you know, that's a different level. It's a different tier of involvement. I, I feel like uh, this person um, gave up on loving Harry Potter. And I can quote the tweet from someone who was literally a a poster child for the Hogwarts School Choir at Universal Studios. If I could not buy the Hogwarts Legacy, so can you. It really is that easy. This is one of the best, most memorable parts of my life, but so-and-so is harming people I care about. So first of all, you're speaking on behalf of someone, which that's fine and all. Everyone does that. Everyone wants to stand up for a friend, a family, whatever. But just because you worked for a choir and you decided to jump on a trend rather than stick and stand by your love of something, that means you've already given up on your childhood in a way. And I can say that because I would rather love Star Wars than someone tell me this and this person, this person is an evil being, so I must give up on Star Wars. Do you know and what I, think, I mean? Uh, yeah, and what I'm, what I'm pondering as you're talking too is I'm just thinking about how many of these franchises and properties now in order to be a fan, in order to purchase them, you're kind of forced into these socio-political corners that you mm -hmm. that didn't uh, used to exist. Like, 
Back in the 70s and the 80s, if you were a Star Wars fan, it didn't matter if you were conservative, it didn't matter if you were liberal, it didn't matter if you were libertarian, it didn't matter if you were uh, any number of things. You'd be a Marxist Star Wars fan, right? Mm -hmm. And nowadays, it seems as if being a part of the fandom of any of these properties comes with the mm -hmm. need to be a part of whatever uh, political movement is associated with them, or else you get othered. And, you know... I think that's a. It's a failed business strategy to split your fan bases uh, along those sorts of lines, and then alienate those who don't fully agree with you on whatever you know ideologies you have. But then, too, I think it engenders animosity between groups. I think we see that all over the place. I I, I think the most successful brands going forward are go going to be those that aim for the sensible middle, right? The moderate middle. Um, if you exclude, let's say, the extremes, the 10% the on the extremes of both sides, and you aim to please everybody in between there, and you don't, uh, you don't run some sort of uh, cultural gatekeeping system that uh, alienates people based on what they believe, I think you're going to be highly su successful as a brand, as a franchise. What say you, Stephen? I, I kind of agree with that. If we look at it this way, at the end of the day, I haven't, uh, okay, besides the voice actor we just saw there in, in the article you brought up earlier, I don't see Hogwarts themselves attacking the fan bases we've seen with other corporations and franchises. I don't see them demeaning anyone. It's everyone around trying to go after people who are fans. And these, some of these are ex-fans, all because of a principle that shouldn't destroy friendships. It shouldn't destroy family. It shouldn't destroy anything. At the end of the day, there used to be a generational mindset. Like, it doesn't matter who you vote how you eat, how you sleep, who you marry, we can still be friends and neighbors and go to a backyard afterwards. And lately it seems to be a more aggressive push that if you're not on my side, you belong on that side and you are automatically the enemy I can no longer associate with you. That, that it doesn't work like that. We're social beings. You can't just pick a side or force people to choose a side just because you don't agree with them or they don't agree with you. And I think we have to go back to that and business needs to keep that as their main price model. Don't look at the villainization look at the quality of the content that is the whole reason why we're making this game to live out your harry potter fantasy that's the that's the end objective here it's not about who did what go at the game because if it's bad if it has a bad launch date if the game has glitches if there's something wrong with the price modeling of the certain editions if you don't like the three-day access because you had to pay a little bit more that's the stuff people should be worrying about because in the, the day it's just a game to provide escapism we don't want the real world injected into escapism we are here for one reason live our lives have some fun maybe have a family and maybe a beer in between that's it that's the way yeah, i look good, at it good points all you know the the interesting thing is going to be yeah. People vote with their wallets, and ultimately that's the case, right? And you can say whatever you want to online. You can uh, do whatever petitions you want. People vote with their wallets, yeah. and businesses listen to those votes. Warner Brothers Discovery is going to look at how this game performs. If it performs exceedingly well as it appears to, then we can expect more games, more shows, more movies going back into Hogwarts and back into that OG mainline Harry Potter franchise. If it doesn't do well, well, they're not going to let the Harry Potter world just, you know, decay. They're not going to leave it uh, where it goes into, you know, not being at the forefront of culture, but they'll probably continue to try to do the auxiliary stuff because they'll view that, well, we can't go back because it's still too spicy. It's too, still too damaged. Right now, yeah. it looks to me like they're going to be going back to the, the stuff that worked for the first decade and a half of the Potterverse. And it's probably funny because if you go through half these people that are complaining and whining and go through their, even their Twitter, Twitter history, I'm not saying do that. And if you, you would probably find them playing Lego Harry Potter back in the day. Are you going to automatically call them out because of that? No. Are you going to go after Lego because they already have a mass amount of Harry Potter games? Why aren't you going after all corporations? Why is it only this one game? Good points. Good points. Well, let's wrap it up there and uh, okay. we'll be getting back to the Disney board situation. Oh my gosh, is that not insane? But we'll be getting back to that very soon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for all of your support for this brand new channel. This little baby is only like uh, two weeks and a, and a few days old, and already you've shown such support, such love, and it's, uh, it's so wonderful to see. If you don't mind, click that like button, click share, and subscribe if you'd like to. All of that helps with the, uh, Google, or the uh, YouTube algorithms, and we certainly would appreciate it. 
Stephen, thank you so much for being here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing you remember from this video, besides being kind, make sure that you keep having fun. Mm-hmm.